to see you this morning. We're so thankful that you are here. And as we've been saying all morning, we've got a few volunteers uh, in the sanctuary today to help us to get ready for your return next week. Hey, let me know where you're watching from, how many people are watching with you. And uh, thank you for responding. We really appreciate that. And man, that was a great prayer this morning, Miguel. And I, I know you felt that and sensed that. And uh, you, you want to be here next week when these doors doors open, it's going to be awesome because we've got one of the greatest MC teams that you've ever heard in your life. So you need to be here at 8.30. The doors will open at 8.30 because at 10 minutes till, if you signed up for a service, uh, your seat's going to be released because at 10 minutes till, we're saying, you know, who's ever here? And uh, so you, you, you may usually get here late, but if you get here late, you may have to come to the second service or stand outside and watch. And uh, not trying to be hard, but we just got to get all these requirements in from the CDC. Um, next week is Pentecost Sunday, the day in which that the Lord birthed his church 3,000 people added to the Lord. I wonder how many we can add. I really believe coming out of this pandemic is going to be a time of great renewal and great revival. So here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to let me know how you will help get ready for Pentecost Sunday. I've been asking people to fast a meal, fast a week. So uh, those of you that are here today, we have some uh, volunteers that are helping us. And those of you that are online. So Today, I'll get to preach to you on camera, and then I'll get to look at real faces of smiling, wonderful people out here today. Hey, those of you that are in here as volunteers, would you give a warm welcome to everybody that's watching online? Come on, let them know. Oh, that's awesome. Wow, let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for being with us. Lord, I pray that you take the words that I speak today and let them be your words. Let me say exactly what you want. Don't let me say anything that you wouldn't want. Lord, I want to be your vessel and your anointing to flow out into the sanctuary and out into the online church everywhere in your name. Well, if you have your Bible, would you hold it up? And uh, let's say this together. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is life to me. Today I receive the word. I confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am obedient. And I will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Wow. Man, it just feels so good to see you in the house. And those of you that will be with us next week. We're continuing this series on essential. And we said about four weeks ago or three weeks ago that we're hearing those words bantered around a lot. This is essential. This is non-essential. And because of that, it's caused a lot of questions, confusion, pain, and uncertainty to the church. Freedoms that we once took for granted and thought would never change of being able to worship together have now been turned upside down. And in many states, thankfully our, our governor is uh, very open to churches being essential. And uh, our president this week said something about that. But here's, here's what that really bothers me in the world we're living today. That it's many of the things that people label essential or non-essential is really maybe not what the ordinary people would say is essential and, and non-essential. It's politicians. I think we live in a nation to world today where a lot of politicians forget that we are not their puppets. That we elect them and we unelect them. I love what Abraham Lincoln said. I've been going back to that this week. That the government is really not the politicians. A lot of times the politicians say, we're your government, let us run, and we've got everything taken care of. But Abraham Lincoln said, our government is by the people and for the people. So I think maybe we need to start renewing that as an essential of what we have. I saw somebody post the other day, why in the world are pot stores, not where you buy pot and pans, but why in the world are pot stores considered essential and churches are not? That's interesting. How is it that having an abortion is more essential than a lot of other things are not? 
Now, I'm not saying if it's, not a, a, if it's something that has to do with life and death, please. I, I don't want to get targeted on those and get a lot of creepy emails. But I really think that we need to take a look at really what is essential. Um, I think for a lot of people, the church has been essential for a long time. Barna, in 2017, wrote an article about how the church attendance has been slipping for years and how that even in the Bible Belt of America, that we're no longer a Christian nation, even in the Bible Belt, but it's a post-Christian nation. Because church has been an elective if you want to do that, if you don't want to do that. But I tell you, I come back to this, that I believe that we don't just open the door and put a sign out and says we're open for business as a church. But I think it's time for us to take a look at, are we really being the church or are we doing church? You see, a lot of people have done just doing church. Well, it's Sunday, so let's get up, let's go. But I think through this pandemic that we've actually seen more people be the church than ever before. I'm seeing people reach out to the neighbors. I'm seeing people uh, pray. I'm seeing people get more involved than ever before. So let's... Let's take a review of what we've said that what is essential and what is not essential. So what does Jesus consider essential? I think I, think I would like to start as a, uh, as a creation. I am a creation of the creator. I want to know what he thinks is essential. And here's what the first week we said, I am essential. Would you say that with me? I am essential. Look at your neighbor and say, you are essential. Look at this, Ephesians 1 and 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So first of all, what is essential? You are essential. I am essential because God chose us. The second thing that's essential is simply this. The experts once asked Jesus. Uh, I know there's 714 different commandments that we're supposed to keep in laws, but what is or what are the essential ones? And here's what Jesus said in Matthew 22, beginning at verse 36. Teacher, which is the most important commandment of the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, would you read it with me? And those of you in the house and those of you at home, read it with me. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important, yourself. And then we looked at last week, John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So we said that obeying is God's love language, but it's not just obeying because I have to, but it's obeying because I get to. So we said last week, loving God is obeying his commandments with an attitude of blessing, not burdensome. I get to, not have to. Would you put that on your, on your post right there? I get to. I get to. It's not I have to, but I get to. We're getting ready to go back, I hope, in the next week or so into our kids' ministry. And I know many of you um, have served there before. So why don't you just put on there, I'm looking forward to get to to get to, get to hold those kids, get to take care of those little babies. It's going to be awesome. So now today, I want to look at the second part of what Jesus said. And he said, uh, love God, right? We're going to love God. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Around here at the Father's house, we just categorize that and say, help people. Say it with me. Help people. Isn't that interesting? We love God. We help people. That's, that's part of who we are. People say, yeah, I, I, love, I, I love people. I love God and I love people. Well, we know that we love people by what we do. So if I'm not helping people, if I'm not caring for people, then how can I say that, that I love people? Why do some people consider the church non-essential? I think some people consider the church non-essential because they think that we really don't care for them, but we want something from them. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I think we need to think about that. I heard, uh, overheard a pastor that was flying on a plane. I, I, I saw he blogged about this. And he said, uh, sitting behind me, I heard a woman aggressively trying to win a businessman to the Lord. And she kept going on and on. And finally, in frustration, the businessman, listen to this. The businessman said to her, ma'am, would you be quiet for just a moment? I would love to listen to you about your Jesus. If you would listen to me for just a moment about my life, where I am right now. The bottom line is, he said to her, you really don't care about me. You're just trying to convert me. That's all you care about. I wonder, does the world think that we just have an agenda to use them? Because I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. And then if they don't do that, then sometimes we turn them off. I think we need to get back to the essential of what Jesus did. Jesus built bridges to people. He didn't build walls. He met their needs. He showed them love. He helped people. Say help people. He helped people. That's around here why we say that. We invest and invite. We don't just say, hey, you need to come to church. Or you need to go with me. It's not just inviting, but we want to invest in people. There's people that I've been investing in for a couple of years, and I, I haven't seen them make a change, but guess what? The Lord just keeps saying to me, reach out, reach out, invest in them, ask questions. How are you doing? Anything I can help you about? Because so many churches, all they're looking for is that they can get another body in church and say they've got another number or they're, they're bigger. No, I think the thing that we're going to see come out of this pandemic is that churches are going to be real, raw, and relevant, and they're going to be churches that grow, that care about people. So, they asked Jesus once, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Is it, uh, is it the person that lives down the street from me? Is it my neighbor? Is my neighbor uh, the person at Starbucks waiting in line before me to get their drink? Jesus wanted to teach them a parable that anybody that comes across our path in our daily life really could be considered our neighbor. So I want to go to some deep theology today. And uh, I wanted to take a little tea break, so uh, watch this cartoon. The Miracle of Mercy, the Good Samaritan. This is Jesus, who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. You see, when Jesus was on earth, he wanted everyone to know what God thought about things. So he took every opportunity to teach people about God's heart. <clears throat> One day, a religious expert stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? <laughs> what does the law say? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> right. All right. Do this and you will live. Wait. The man then asked, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. <laughs> They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. <laughs> By chance, a priest came along. <laughs> but when he saw the man lying there, Ugh, yuck. he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. La 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la, whoa! Another man who worked in the temple who was called a Levite walked over and looked at him lying there. He's out. Uh, huh? But he also passed by on the other side. Then a Samaritan came along. Uh. Samaritans were hated by Jews. They were seen as lesser people and Jews would not interact with them. But when the Samaritan saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. 
Then he put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. One room, please. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Wow. Well, I think you'll remember the story a little bit better now, right? All right. That kind of helped us all getting some deep theology. So I want us to learn some lessons now from SOS. Learn some lessons from the story of Sam. Are you ready? You can write these down. You can take a picture with your camera, do whatever you But here's the first one. Expect divine disruptions. Expect divine disruptions. So look at this story. In, verses, in verse 30, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, about 17, 18 miles, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, here it is, divine disruption. Say it again, divine disruption. So by chance, you could really say, by divine disruption, a priest came along. But when he saw the man, notice he sees the man lying there. He crossed to the other side of the road and passed by. And then a temple assistant <clears throat> walked over. He looked at him lying there. Both of them saw him. That's the thing you got to see in this. They both saw him. And they, he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Sometimes what we see as disruptions may be divine appointments instead of the devil's schemes, right? I mean, it's rare that we wake up in the morning and simply say, oh, wow, you know what, today? I don't have a whole lot going on, so uh, I'm just going to go out and look for someone to help. I, uh, by raising hands, how many of you prayed that prayer this morning? Thank you, everybody's saved. Um, nobody prayed that prayer this morning. Lord, today's going to be a great day of divine disruptions. Uh, my schedule is not important to me. The things that I'm going to do with my family are not important. So uh, I'm praying and looking forward to some divine disruptions into my life. Proverbs 16 and 9 says, We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Make your plans this week expecting that God may want to bring a divine disruption in your life with someone that has a need so that you can be his hands and his mouth and his joy to come into their life. That great theologian, uh, German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, writes in a book called Life Together. Listen to this. I'll put it up on the screen. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths, canceling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions. We may pass by them, preoccupied with our more important task. It's a strange fact that Christians and even ministers frequently consider their work so important and urgent that they will allow nothing to disturb them. They think they're doing God a service in this, but actually we are disdaining God's crooked yet straight path. Disruptions can be seen as God's divine appointments for us to help people. So we shouldn't look at people and divine interruptions or disruptions as, as uh, obstacles, but we should look at them for as opportunities to embrace God's plan. Opportunities to embrace God's plan. So this week, I promise you, because you've heard this teaching, this week I promise you that there will be something 
or someone that will come into your life and bring a disruption now that you've heard this teaching. And you know what? At your first usual thing would be, well, I'm going to just ru- get them off of me as soon as I can. I'm not going to answer the phone. I'm not going to answer the text. I, I'm going to just be sort of be curt and get them. But now that you've heard this truth, you know what's going to happen? This week when someone or something disrupts you, you're going to say, oh, this could be a, a God appointment. God may want to use me because I'm chosen and he's asked me to do a good work, and I love God, and it's not that I have to do these things, but I get to them, and so maybe he wants me to be his hands and his arms reaching out to someone. It may be somebody who comes to your desk at work or gives you a phone call and says, I just got a report, and they found that it's cancer, and they need somebody to listen, somebody to pray for them. Not give them a trite thing, oh, it's all going to be all right. Or maybe it's a man that comes to you from work and to you a man and he comes and says, she left. She took the kids and left. I've been working so hard on my marriage and she's found somebody else and she left. So what are you going to do? Are you going to see that as a divine appointment? To be able to minister in words. And again, not those little trite things of, oh, okay, I'll I'll tell you, I'll I'll pray for you. I've learned a long time ago, I quit telling people, I'll pray for you. If I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to pray for you right then. Because I think sometimes those are religious phrases that we say, oh, I'll pray for you, and then we never pray for them. So I I just think we need to think about that. Maybe it'll be the person in your life group. You know, the annoying one in your life group. You know who I'm talking about. Every life group generally has one of those annoying people who want to talk all the time. And you say, oh, no, not in our life group. Uh Uh-huh. It's you. (laughs) But maybe in the past you've been annoyed by that person. But maybe all of a sudden you realize... Maybe this is a divine appointment that I need to listen to what's behind the words that this person is speaking. Why haven't we become so selfish? Because that's the way of the world, right? My needs, mine, mine. Now, I'm not, I'm, there's a difference between a need of a person and a needy person. How many of you know needy people? Yeah, I mean, they've always got a need that you should meet. Sometimes we, get, we, we create, make them more codependent than they should. And I think what we have to realize is that some people are just needy, and we need God's wisdom how to handle them. But I think because we've seen so many needy people, sometimes we don't even see the people that have a need. So number two, don't talk yourself out of helping people. Don't talk yourself out of helping people. You see a divine disruption, and then, I mean, put yourself in, your priest, in the priest's shoes. Maybe he's had a busy day of ministry. Maybe he has a very high-maintenance wife. And if he's late, she starts throwing dishes at him when he comes in the house. I mean, we don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, he could say all of those things. So just put yourself there. In fact, that happens to all of us, doesn't it? We see a need. And then we start talking ourselves out of it. Well, I'm not sure this is really something I can deal. This guy wasn't a doctor. He just simply said, I'll do what I can do. And, I, and we'll, we'll make sure of that. So it's not necessary that you have all the answers or you're a psychologist or psychiatrist, but you have the ability to be the Lord's hands. I mean, instead of saying, well, I don't know. If I take this phone call, then they'll keep me on the phone for another week, another hour, and they're always having an issue. They always have a problem, and I don't know, and in the midst of all of this, and, and maybe if I give this person money that say that they're a homeless vet and they're hungry, and, uh, you know, that maybe I'm just I'm, I'm giving them money and they're just going to go drink on that so maybe I'll just keep my money and I won't do anything about that isn't it interesting when something happens in our life that we can talk ourselves out of helping people we want to help people number three we need to care enough to act not care enough to think but care enough to act don't just say oh yeah that person has a need yeah okay okay We are called to care so deeply that we have to act. The scripture said he felt compassion for them. 
Here's the Greek word. I'll put it up there for you. It's spaghetti and meatballs. It's just as easy to say that as it is to say that word. I could tell you what it is, but you would doubt it. And so we'll just say spaghetti and meatballs. What it means, it means that your insides, literally in the Greek, it's your bowels yearn because of that person. It means to feel deep sympathy. It means to ache so much on the inside that you're moved to action. It's an inward an aching for someone who is in need. That it moves us. It drives us. It compels us. It shakes us to action. The Jews hated the Samaritans. And the guy that was in a need was a Samaritan. I was a Jew, but it was a Samaritan that helped him. I mean, in fact, the Jews hated the Samaritans so much that they would walk around the town rather than even walk near a Samaritan. But listen to this. Listen to this. This is so important. The closer I get to Christ, the more I care for the things that he cares for. And the more that I care for the things that he cares for, the closer I get to Christ. People saying, I'm waiting for a breakthrough in my life. Maybe the breakthrough is God has sent you some divine disruptions, but we've been so busy with our own self, we don't take time to be his hands because he's chosen us in advance to be his representatives here on this planet Earth. It says, they pass by on the other side, but not the Samaritan. Verse 34, going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them, put him on his own donkey, took him to the inn. Now, I don't know how far it was. It may have been 17 miles. It may have been 15 miles. And the Samaritan goes out of his way. It cost him something, lets the guy ride his donkey. He walks alongside. Did, did you see what happened? He, he was awakened to that. Compassion causes us to do something that may cost us. Verse 35, the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, which is two weeks' pay for him, two weeks' salary. And he said, take care of this man, and if the bill runs higher, I'll pay it next time I'm here. Not only does a divine interruption take time from us, but it also costs us. He didn't say, well, now I've done my part and I'm just going to leave you over to somebody else. No, he doesn't do that. But he follows through. And he says, whatever else needs to be done, I'll do that. I'm thinking about people that volunteer, maybe like in kids ministry or to usher or to park cars. Some people get excited at the very beginning and they say, oh, yeah, I'll do that because they're moved by whatever it is. But then they never follow through. When it gets hard or it gets difficult, they just bail out and say, let somebody else do it. Listen, here at the Father's house, if you, you call the Father's house your home, here's what we're all about. We're about loving God and we're about helping people. It's all about people. It's all about caring for people. And Jesus said, which of these three should you do? And he said, well, the Samaritan. And he said, yeah, go and do likewise. Here's number four. Remember... Helping people changes lives. Helping people changes lives. Helping people changes lives. The closer to Christ I get, I'm going to care for the things that matter to him. And when I care for what matters to him, I then become his minister to minister to people. If I just tell you that I'm going to do something and I don't do it, it doesn't help. Here at the Father's house, because of your giving let me tell you some things that we've been able to help people. The family service team have, have saw 30 people either in a hospital or at a home just during this pandemic. And they also contacted 134 people with the over 65 list. And then we as pastors have literally called everyone that we have a phone number for and just checked on you to see how you were doing. This is the Father's house. We help people. The TFH sewing team sewed over, listen to this, 1,000 masks. Would you give the Lord a hand clap for that? And they did another 100 just to help people that are in need. We, have, we gave uh, gift cards for the doctors and the nurses at Leesburg Hospital in the ER area who's working with the COVID patients. We did the blood drive and we gave blood. We, the other, last week, we gave away I don't know how many gallons 
how many pounds of food that we gave away. We did a drive-through prayer, and people come through and, and uh, had prayer. Those are all things that, because we want people to know at the Father's house, we're about loving God, and we're about helping people. So what does that mean to us? Maybe you would say, you know what, Terry? I, uh, I've really been guilty of being like those who walk by the other side. I've lost my compassion for people. But today, I'm going to ask the Lord to renew my compassion. Maybe that's you online or those of you that are here. And I mean, the Lord is just like that. He's brought someone or something to your mind. I'm telling you, I'm really focused when I start working. Man, I'm, I'm zeroed in on that uh, because I work in spurts. I, I think if I was labeled as a kid today, I would be ADD or whatever you call it, ADT, AD, bi, whatever. I don't, not bi, certainly not that, sorry. But whatever it be, because I like things quick, do this, and quick, something else. I got to be careful. So let's strike that for the sermon that goes out, but it's already out, right? And uh, sometimes people will knock on my door. Sometimes people just burst in, never knock. And they'll say, uh, you have a minute? My inclination is, heck no. It's valuable. But I've learned that if I'm going to be who he wants me to be and love people, help people, I need to be able to take a disruption as maybe it might be a divine appointment. You know what I've had? I've had people say to me, thank you for listening. And I didn't say anything. I didn't say, well, let's kneel down here and let me cast four devils out of you and pray the joy of the Lord in your life. I said nothing. I just listened. And they'll say, man, my life, my life is so much better today because I listened. How about if we listen to that person that's standing in line behind us at the grocery store and tries to, s to start a conversation? How about if we listen to that person across the gas pump where we're getting gas and, and, they, and they want to talk? I watched an elderly gentleman yesterday, Anita and I stopped at one of the local restaurants. Hey, let me encourage you during this time to support our local businesses. Would you do that? And if you don't have any of these cards, something extra to show you God loves you, and uh, leave it with a good tip. And on the back, it's the true life uh, uh, videos that we have and information about the Father's house. Come by this week and get you a bunch of those and leave a good tip. So I watched this gentleman that was eating by himself and he got up and he went to somebody over there and he said, bet you can't guess how old I am. I'm 84. I don't look 84, do I? You always know that people know that you look older than you are when people never say, oh, you look so young. And he walked over to another lady who looked like she was on her last leg and he said, I'm 84. She said, oh, you look good for 84. That's because she didn't have her glasses on. She was blind. But I watched that man leave. And I got to selfishly tell you, know that I was teaching this today. And I just quietly looked at my food and prayed quietly. Please don't let him come and strike up a conversation. And you know what? He didn't. He walked right by our table and walked out. And the Lord reminded me, why didn't you make eye contact with him? Is your time so valuable that maybe a man that lives by himself? So you see, I'm not talking to you about something you need to do. I'm talking about something we all need to do. Let's pray. Father, would you help us to walk close with you and to be who you want us to be? Let me, let me talk to somebody today that maybe you've never invited Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life and you say you know I, I don't even know where to begin I just feel so I just feel so focused in on myself I, I don't know what else to do you see it's not in us doing good works it's the Lord Jesus Christ coming into our heart to forgive us of our sins and you're watching today and it's not an accident that you're watching you're watching because the Lord really cares for you today. It's not an accident that you're watching. 
And he's saying to you, I want to come into your life. I want to forgive you of your sins, and I want to give you a purpose for life. To be chosen by God to do good works in this world that's so selfish. So today, if you've never invited Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life, I want to lead you in a prayer right now. Would you pray this prayer with me? Pray this prayer with me. Father God, thank you today for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I confess with my mouth, as I believe in my heart, that you are the Christ. You are the Lord. You rose from the dead so that I could have life. And today I want you into my life. As best as I know how, I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name.